I'm going to try not to go too fast because we have to keep doing this week after week. This is such important, good, foundational teaching that the Lord has given me that I want to take our time and let's just get this. I want you to get this to the point that you can teach this, that you're going to find yourself drawing out. I probably need to redraw Gary down there. I, I, I made big old muscles and but he said, honey, you made my hands bigger than my muscles. So uh, that's this little thing right down here. And I'm going to just try to do a little better job on that here in a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that was, that I was trying to make him feel, ooh, make him feel really, really good. But um, <laughs> oh, no, yeah, that was it. It just does it every time. <laughs> Woo, honey, 34 years, touchy feely. That's where we were at touchy feely. He wants us to know who we are in this kingdom because it's we're not going to do this by ourselves. The Lord let me know. I went through a time in my life that I was real pardon me, but very sick of church. Well, I'm still sick of church. Meaning religious gatherings and organized what we call organized worship. And we have I'm telling you there's people that have just just uh prostituted worship they sell worship they call it worship they're building churches on just talent let me tell you you can bring people in to hear good talent you can bring people in to hear good preaching but let me tell you something what what the lord it's beyond that how you're going to keep people is because they're connected and god has set them in the body as it has pleased him and now we know in the big picture you've all got gifts but also he brings together little gatherings like this and that's what that's how, that's our philosophy that you're not here because we went out and solicited you or because we've got the best preaching or the best singing. You're here because God has brought you here. And you're going to connect to one another. And I'm going back to that power in prayer. It's going to take us praying together. Because it's together that we, have, we are the body. And so the more we gather together, he said, assemble yourselves. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves. And that's not just on Sunday morning. We do a lot of assemblies in this church, a lot of little gatherings of people. And that's the, that is the core of this church. It's many, many gatherings so that we learn each other. We learn how to put up with each other's stuff. We know and we recognize everybody here has got some issues. Nobody's issue free in this church. We need to have T-shirts that says, I've got issues. Follow me to Christian gathering. You'll fit in real good. Yeah, I got issues. And sometimes we get issues with one another, don't we? But how do you overcome issues with one another? Which this is not my message. But you overcome it because you love one another. And the way you get love is through maturity. You start learning. Oh, you get that first love. Woo, I just love Jesus, love everybody. And you think everybody's perfect. Oh, those church people. Now if I can just be like you. And then you hang out with them for a while and you realize they're... They got issues. But still, the Lord is trying to get us back past that. And those are foundational teachings that you've got to have the love of God or you're really not going to go forward anywhere. I don't care how much preaching you got. You can speak in tongues. Your face turns blue. You can give your body to be burned. You can go and help the homeless. You can help the child, the, the, the children on the street. But if you don't have love and you're just doing it out of, oh, the goodness, but love of God is what really connects. And people, it's irresistible. It's irresistible when people love you. But the Lord has spoke a word to me, and I may have even said this last week because I may not even get past the first page I preached last week. But he said to me in the Spirit, he said, the presence, the problem that people are having is not the presence of Satan. It's the absence of prayer. It's not the presence of Satan. It's the absence of prayer. And now when I'm saying prayer here, I'm not talking about, Lord, you need to go do this, and Lord, you need to go do that. We spend half our prayer time telling God what he needs to do. Don't we? Lord, you know this. Yeah, he does. He knows. But what we're doing, prayer there means communicating. I need to spend time with the Lord. And here, y'all have come here. Just want to spend some time with him and each other. That's very commendable. I, I, I worry about people that can't, that they just miss a lot because they're, they're missing out. They're missing out, and they're missing out not only this corporate, when we all start singing, Lord, I believe in you. It's different than just me singing. I, I feel the Lord in my car. I have those personal time with him, but also there's a time in here when we come together. There's a power, and so when we get together, it's not the presence of Satan is our problem. This is not about the kingdom of Satan. We're not living in a kingdom of Satan, and I'm going to quickly, I hope you all see this before, but kind of quickly go back over this. 
um, oh, I, and, and for, John gave me a scripture I didn't do last week, believe it or not. I have a million of them. But there's always more. But the Bible says in Psalms 115 and uh, 16, the heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's. But the earth he has given to the children of men. Now, we've been talking about two kingdoms here. We've been talking about the earth. This is the earth down here, in case you guys don't know. Y'all ain't memorized this by now. How many of y'all got your notebooks to take notes? Oh, four of y'all got my message. Five. Oh, six. Okay. Remember, I talk fast, and hopefully I'm going to give you such good stuff that you need to write some stuff down and go meditate on it and think about it later. Now, at some point, you ought to be able to write this in your, and already do this for your kids, uh, your friends. When they're having a problem, you're going to say, I know what your problem is. You're, you're torn between two kingdoms. you got your flesh man that we all live in. The king of this world has been given to man. We have been given dominion. He told Adam and Eve, I'm giving you the dominion. This is the garden. You tend it. What have you named the animals? You have, you have everything here in this garden is yours. You can eat of all of these thousands of trees is here. There's just one tree I don't want you to eat of. So what he gave him was an option. That's all that was, was an option. It was saying, choose me or you can choose that. Because y'all got to get this. If you don't have a choice then, then to love somebody or not, then you, it's not really love. You're forcing them. It's like a shotgun wedding. You've got to marry this woman. That he's holding a shotgun. God's not holding a shotgun on you. He wants you to love him because he chooses to love him. And he had to give them an option to say, no, I want to go choose knowledge, and I want to do it my way. So it was eat, it, eat the tree of knowledge and do it man's way and my own knowledge, or am I going to do it God's way? Because right here, there's always a choice. And right now, we live in this world. This is the earth. It's the kingdom of man. This is the human world. It's what we call the world. It's, it, there's darkness around us spiritually until you get his light. There is, we live in the flesh here. We, it's a temporal. It's visible. It's what we see, what we call, it's the difference in religion and relationship. Up here in the kingdom, we have the kingdom of God. It's called the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of the spirit versus the flesh, light versus darkness, heaven versus world, God versus man, eternal versus temporal, Invisible, visible, relationship, or just religion. So these are two worlds that at the same time both of us, are li- we're all living in. I live in my flesh. I'm having to contend I've, with my old flesh. But at the same time, I am, and I'm having to go fast over last week. But and you need to get the, go listen to it online. But I, am a, I have dual citizenship. I'm a citizen, a citizen proudly of Texas. In the United States of America, and I'm a citizen of God's kingdom. So at any time I live in my flesh, but I also got my spirit. My flesh is saying, go eat everything you can eat. My spirit may say, you need to fast. You need to fast. Or the, the, my, my mind may say, oh, the doctor just said you have a disease and it's incurable. But my spirit goes, oh, wait a minute. With God, all things are possible. God is a healer. So here I have two voices. Let me, re- let me just draw this. I'm hoping I'm going to make sense because I'm having to play catch up before I can get to the rest of it. Uh, I'm just going to draw a stick figure here so it won't look like the jumbo uh, little doughboy. There is voices coming from this world, and I have voices coming from this world. I have the Holy Spirit speaking to me, the things of God, speaking faith to me, saying, you'll just walk and talk with me. I'll tell you what's good. I'll tell you what's evil. I will, I will direct your ways. He's right here speaking to y'all. Do y'all hear the Lord speaking to you in your life? He speaks through his written word. He speaks through his spirit. He's constantly, these voices are coming down. He's speaking to you in his spirit. But then there also is other voices at the same time. It's your flesh. It's your five senses. It's your eyes, your ears, your nose. It's seeing things. It's seeing things from this view. It's, it's over here. And it's just, it's an option. It's an, I can listen to this voice, the world, or I can listen to these voices any given time. And this is where the battle is. 
Do I walk according to what the doctor said, my ears? Do I walk according to what my, my eyes look in my, uh, my checkbook and it says I'm uh, about to overdraft or I just did and just cost myself $35 for an overdraft? Do I, am I going to depend on what I can see or am I, in my natural eyes or am I going to depend on what I can see in the spirit and go, God, I don't know how I'm going to pay these bills. I don't know, but I know you're my provider. And the Holy Spirit's saying, you just trust me. You just trust me. You just trust me. I know how to take care of what belongs to me. At any given time, we've got two voices voices coming into us we used to say you got the devil and we got we got Jesus you know this little girl day she's I feel like I got the devil on this side and the devil on this side sometimes we just feel like that's all we're hearing but no there is a voice and especially when you have been born again you have access to a voice and he will never stop speaking to you you might want to stop listening but he is constantly speaking into you. And this world is there. So you have this coming into you. But what you got to realize until you get this, then when you get this, then you start taking dominion from here to this world. And then I start walking in the power that he's given me. When somebody's sick on the job or somebody's happening, instead of me getting in the molly grubs with them, all of a sudden I've got a word for them. I am taking dominion of this earth. The only way I do it, remember, Jesus said I have all power in heaven and earth. I am the king of kings. Now, he made us a king. We are now his kings, because, and he's the king of kings. He's given us delegated authority. He said, if, I, if I'm in you and you're in me, whatever I do, you can do. Whatever you see God do, and he's telling you in your spirit, you can do that. Then you can do that. If he tells you to quit your job today and go out and, and, and do something, you're like, Lord of mercy. And I'm not telling me quit your job. But if he told you, I remember he told me. He told me it's time to go beyond the gate. And I left my career. And I felt like I had lived all my life to be a chaplain to those incarcerated youth. I loved it. And I was very good at that. But it was for a season. It was for a season in my life. And then all of a sudden, it was time to change. That was the hardest thing I ever did. The night I left, it was 3 o'clock in the morning when I drove out those gates. I was up there loading up my Suburban and my books and my things and just, you know, just trying to make sure everything. I, it, was, it was the hardest thing I ever did was drive out those gates and leave my keys and take my badge off. But you know what? I had to trust him because I heard a word in my spirit that said it's time to go beyond the gate. He was going to take me somewhere I'd never been before, and it was not going to be an easy thing. But let me tell you something. When I can listen to the king, that I'm going to walk in dominion. And what he's doing here at I Name God is he's training us for reigning. He's training us with all of this we've been talking about, that I know who I am. I have access to this. I am in Christ. He's in me. That means I have anything he tells me to do, I can do it. This doesn't mean I can just go, oh, I'm just going to go out and do this. No, it's not what my, my mind says, my flesh says to me. It's what is the Spirit saying to me. So I'm going to move along. That was a, a little bit of fast catch-up, and I may have just completely confused you. But I had to lay a foundation. These fancy pens, I have a hard time. I'm electronically challenged. That, not that that's electronic. <sighs> For me, it probably is. But I love this. He said, I, in Jeremiah, he said, I made the earth and the man and the beast that are upon the ground by my great power and by my outstretched arm. Remember, we all preached about the arm of God here. I preached lately about his mighty arm. He said, I made everything, man and the animals and the earth, and then I have given it to whom it seemed fit unto me. It's his choice. I made everything, and then I say, Frank, I'm going to give you this dominion. I'm going to give you, you're going to be right here, and I'm giving you gifts, and I'm going to give you responsibility, and I'm going to give you a call on your life as it seems fit to me. That's why you call with the elect of God. Let me tell you what he's electing you for. I believe he elects the whole world for salvation, but I believe he elects each one of us for purpose. You've been elected for a purpose, Mike. You've been elected for a purpose, Vicky. Vicky. And he has said, I am giving it to this places of this world, this kingdom down here. This is the kingdom of man. It's not the kingdom of Satan. It's the kingdom of this world. Now, Satan just comes. He's that little voiceover. He's been given a designated power. He has given a time and very limited in what he can do. What he does is speak to you and try to confuse you and try to get you off of this and lie to you so you don't know who you are, that you don't know that he has made everything by his outstretched arm and he given it to those who he seems meet or fit to give it to. And then he goes, he said, I have given all these lands to the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant and the beast of the field. I have given to him to serve him. He said, I gave Nebuchadnezzar this area. I made him king. 
God rises up and brings down. He may make you the boss. He may make you the servant. He, may, he has chosen you where you are. If you've got a business, God has given it to you. And wherever you're positioned, God has ordained that. You've got to start seeing this. It's your little domain. Someone said you've got to own your zone. Or to own your zone. He has placed it to you. He gave this to Nebuchadnezzar. He said, I give you this kingdom, and I give you the beast of the field to serve you. The Bible says that all the animals is under the domain of man. They're here to serve us. This is our world. This is not the devil's world. It's the children of God. Now, man lost it for a while, but when Jesus came, he gave it back to the kingdom of He said, you are now me in the world, and I have all power. All power. Not, not all power except what the devil has. No, he's got all power. And if Satan's doing something, it's because God has allowed it. And here's, let me tell you, and I said this last week, it was God's sovereign will to give man a will. And he lets people make choices. People blame God. People go, somebody goes over and rapes somebody. Oh, look, if there's a God, why does he let rape happen? If there's a God, why does he let some bombers blow up people on, on the, in the marathon? If there's a God, they're blaming God for the choices of humans. God let people make a choice. But as soon as he seen that bomb, he was probably screaming in those boys, don't do that. They may have heard a song on the radio that morning, but I guarantee he tried to persuade them, do not do that. That's evil. You've been deceived by false religion, but they made the choice. But as soon as he said, he said, who am I going to get around here that I can make a hero out of? You, sir, with the cowboy hat, you get right over here. You're going to be right here. You don't even know why you're walking here because you're going to be right there and you're going to save that man that got his legs blown off. Then you see the goodness of God even in tragedy. That's God. It's the goodness of God. But people are so confused. They blame God for these things. You don't blame God. The Bible says that... uh, 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 Job, he never blamed God. He 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 belly right. He griped around. Job didn't do all, didn't handle it all perfect. He whined. He, but you know what? He never charged God foolishly. He said. You see, we've got to know where these things are coming from. And that's what I'm trying to get to. What is happening in our world? Is this all the devil? See, the devil's trying to lie to you. That's all. He's got one little voice over here. you got all heaven coming in. And this one little voice is trying to lie to you and tell you some uh, fictitious lie that religion has told us that there's some imaginary war over your head for your soul. God and the devil is fighting for you. I wonder who's going to win. This right here, this is going to shock you. The fight is not up here. This is not the fight. This is not the angel of God against the devil's demons. Mm -mm. They're speaking to you, and they're speaking to you. And the war, the battleground is right here. Between your ears. Oh, this is not not your everyday spiritual warfare teaching. This is empowering you to know who you're in. Thank you, Bubba. He just seems like Bubba to me. But Shane, we missed you last two weeks. We're so glad my Bubba's back today. Our resident redneck is just not the same without you. Do you see this? There is voices that's in this domain, which is Satan and his little demons that are liars. God don't love you. You ain't nothing. How can you raise your hands and praise God after what you did last night? Look at you. You ain't nothing. Lies, 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 lies. And then recordings from lies from a child. Oh, you're stupid. Well, your sister, how come you can't make good grades like your sister can? Why do you always have to do, why do you always mess up? You always, you always, you always. Why are you so dumb? Why are you so ugly? Why are you so fat? Why are you so skinny? We hear all these voices. They're voices from this world. Our environment. It's toxic. If we don't care, care, be careful, we can feed into that. It's all the negative. From this world, my flesh, just my, old, my five senses, from religion, 
Oh, you, you, you're going to go to hell. You're going to go to hell. Oh, God hates you. God's the reason why that happened to you. That's the reason. It was God that took your baby. It was God that took your husband. It's God the reason why your wife cheated. No, it's not. It's just we live in a world. We live in a world with germs. We will, as soon as they left the garden, thorns grew. There was no thorns before that. We live in a world where there's germs and there's, there's things that happen to us, our flesh. We just live in a world like that. Sometimes we're drinking something that we don't even know that could be toxic. And the next week they come out and say that drink is causing uh, cancer or it's causing birth defects or it's causing the... We don't know. We live in a world that we are not in control. This is a fleshly world. We live in a human body. And, and if you think about it, you live in fear all the time because we just be washed our hands, become germophobics. You know, but, which, but here's the deal. We don't... We have to live in this world, but we are not of this world. This is not all we have. We're just passing through this world. This is where we really live. My spirit man is already seated with Christ in heavenly places. I can talk to him at any given moment. I've got angels in this room that are warring on my behalf. And the Lord will speak to you in the worst time. I remember I was walking down the stairs one day. You'll remember where it is when God speaks to you. I, was, I don't know, I don't remember what was going on, but I was walking down the stairs and the Lord said to me, there's more that be with you that be with them. I felt like everybody was against me at work and he said to me, there's more that be with you than they would be with them. Now he wasn't just talking about angels and things fighting on my behalf. I had more friends than I even knew at work. At that point, I felt like the lowest man on the totem pole because this woman out there was running her mouth about me and I just thought everybody was believing her. And let me tell you, the devil is such a liar. When you just get up and hold your, no, I don't care. I got a word from the Lord now. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And I used to think that was just the Bible. He was telling that to people the Bible hadn't been written yet. When the Lord speaks a word to you, you don't forget it and it'll give you faith. And I was able, I said, okay, if I'm the only person, I'm going to go out there. They can lie on me. They're just jealous because I love those boys, and it was irresistible. They couldn't figure out why those guys was, wanted to be, talk to me and come to chapel. My chapel was overflowing. It was a security problem because they all wanted to come to chapel. They started lying on me. But the truth is, you know what happened the next, just about two months later? I was voted. Now, this is my first year in Texas Youth Commission. I was voted the employee of the year. There was more to be with me than they that be with them. <laughs> Woo! I got that trophy. You walk in TYC. They right now on their board, they got these little plaques. They got little gold plates. And I forget what year it was. It'll say Pamela Weeby. My first year's they said they did there's nobody on that board that the first year's employee became employee of the year. See, that's what God can do. The devil is a liar. If you hold your head up and go, well, I can't help what they say to me. I'm going in the name of the Lord because I have a word. When you hear from this kingdom, you will take dominion. And you will not listen and be persuaded. Because before you know it, the, the doctor lays out, oh, it just looks bad. And then you make a mistake, get on the computer looking up. <laughs> oh, Lord, it really looks bad. I get on the computer and read all those things. But let me tell you something. That's our flesh. That's okay. We don't, we're not acting like we're ignorant down here. But the truth is, there's more than what you can see. And Paul said, if we had only in this life, that if that's all I had is what I could see, he goes, we'd be of all men most miserable. He'd be pretty miserable if that's all I had is what man can do, the world can do, what, what, what I can see. Because I can't even see, turn the lights off, I can't see nothing. What my flesh can do, what's visible, I'm so glad there's more than what meets the eye. I'm so glad that when I'm having to look at someone in that casket, they're not really there. That I know this is not the end. I will see them again. I will see them again. That's why I grieve, but I don't grieve as those who have no hope. Because my hope is in the eternal part. There's two kingdoms existing at the same time. Heaven is not a city somewhere you're going to go to. Heaven is a dimension that's above you right now. It's alive and well. It's the kingdom of God. And, and the kingdom is now in us. It's inside me. He said the kingdom is inside man. And so that way I bring this kingdom down to this kingdom. That's why the Lord's prayer says, Thy will be done, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth, this realm as it is up here. Everything's working groovy up here. The problem is down here. 
Because Satan still has a time to work. He's still, the, uh, uh, he's still the option going, hey, choose me, choose me, believe me. Don't believe what the Word says, believe what I say. Believe what your flesh says, believe what your, fa- fl- your flesh feels. I'm telling you, I, I just experienced a little miracle the other day. I was so sick, out of the blue, bam, I just got this virus. I am so sick, and I'm laying on the bed, I'm, fixed to, I'm, I'm just fixing to throw up. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm get up, and I know it's, I'm running. I'm literally running to the bathroom. And as I go through the kitchen, I, instead of, I even, it sounds gross, but I was even afraid to open my mouth. But for some reason, as I went around the corner, I said, you are my healer. I said it out my mouth. I said, you're my healer. And I'm telling you what, before I got to the bathroom, it was gone. I did not throw up. I hate to throw up. It ain't pretty. It ain't pretty. I just sprayed out. You are my healer. Oh, and it happened. I'm not saying it's going to happen over time. Everybody gets viruses. That doesn't mean you're bad or wrong. That's part of life. We still live in an earthen vessel. But thank God I have treasure in an earthen vessel. There's more to Pam than what you see. You see, I had been given a word this weekend. What I come back with was knowing a little bit more who I am. This conference we went to, really what I got was a word of confirmation. It was such a confirmation of so many levels of things we're doing right in this church. Yeah. Things that we're doing right. Things that we, it confirmed what we've been hearing, that y'all been hearing, what Gary and I have heard. And what's happened in this church. It was so powerful. So now we've got a word from the Lord. We're coming back. We're strengthened. Why? Because I've been in the presence of other people. And we have been strengthened inside our core. We know who we are. And this is what has to happen. You've got to know who you are. You've got to know where the battle lies. If you don't, you will not take dominion. You will not walk in there and do it with authority. Do you think I'm preaching today a little bit more authority than I was last week? I feel like I am. You know why? Because I feel like I know a little bit more about who I am and what I've been called to do. Me and Gary sat in that motel and we wrote down, we made plans. We sat there and wrote down, what is it God has called us to do? And one thing is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And I was so glad when, 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 uh, when, when Penny and Lloyd come in here with that little clip and reminding us that's what it's about. Yes, we had time for that. Yes, we're going to give money to that. Because you support, your money will flow into what your passion is. And our passion is to build your ministries, not to build our ministry. It's to help you be everything you can be and know it. Because you've got to know this stuff because if not, you'll believe the lies. Truth dispels lies. Light dispels darkness. That's all you got to get. I just got to get you the light. And I'm on the first paragraph. Three pages. The devil knows he cannot stop the big picture. So all he can do is attempt to distract individuals from enjoying life and completing their purpose. That's all he can do is try to trip you up and get you off course. So this is where we're going here. This all started as I looked at a, uh, I was reading a little devotion, and it was a different version. I think it was NIV, and I, I usually read King James. But the way the words was written, it just jumped out at me. It was just one phrase. It said, endure hardship as discipline. And I think I said this last week. But usually when I would think about the word discipline, endure hardship, trials, these things that come to you, and all of a sudden you're getting an onslaught from this world. And maybe you're not doing so well in this area. Maybe you're not really hearing God. Maybe you've not really been in the Spirit. Maybe you're just walking according to what the world's doing and your friends are doing. You've just been walking along here. And all of a sudden you're going through some hardships. Or maybe you've just really been in His presence. Either way... I used to think that hardship, when I, when I looked at the word discipline, endure hardship as discipline, I always looked at that as like a child, and you've heard me say this, if your child, you have a two-year-old that keeps running in the street, and you know it's not good for them, they're going to get killed sooner or later, so you discipline them. You, sp- you spank them all the way back to the house. You get serious about those things. Your kid that's, that's poking things in the electrical socket or, or touching fire or playing with matches, that it, it, you, know, you know it's, so you're going to discipline them, Right? You're going to correct them. Why? Because you love them. And I looked at this word because in the King James, this word right here actually says chastisement. So when I think chastisement, I think of punishment or correcting you for your own good. But really when I looked at this, this time when it said endure hardship as discipline, I didn't think about discipline being correction. I thought about discipline. Immediately come to me, it's like the military. It's becoming disciplined. Endure hardship as discipline. 
It's like a person, if you're going to go join the military, and we have some military people here, the first thing you're going to do is go through boot camp, aren't you? And what happens in boot camp? Would you, would you say there's some hardship? Oh, there's some hardship, isn't it? Now, the hardship they're putting you through, are they giving you hardship because you did something wrong? They're giving you hardship because you done some, because you made a choice to join that uh, area of the service and they want to now get you ready for your calling. If you sign up to be a, a, in the Air Force, they're going to start disciplining you. They're going to start training you. And eventually they're going to teach you how to fly an airplane probably or do something in whatever your specific job is going to do. So when you get saved, when you join this family, you join God, what we call God's army or those things, the first thing you do is go through basic boot camp. And that's what everybody goes through. Whether you're going to be a sniper or you're going to be a, a, a Navy SEAL and you're going to, whatever you're going to do, no matter what you're going to do, there's basic training. It's the foundation. You're going to run a lot of laps. You're going to unload a weapon over and over and over until you got it so good. When you're on the battlefield, you ain't to worry about how, now where's this go? No, you've done it so much, you can do it in your sleep. And they do it over and over, and they run you over and over, and they make you have every morning. And, I mean, I've seen enough movies. That mean, it ain't fun. I'm like, who does that? they got to be a hero just to join. Desperate something. But you know what they're doing? Because they have a purpose. It's not for nothing. The pain is not for nothing. They're not just because they're sadistic people say, put that big old backpack and run now for 10 miles. They're not doing that because they're mad at them. They may act like it. They're not doing it because they've done something wrong. They're doing it because they know when they get over there to Afghanistan, they're going to be carrying those packs over the desert, and they, they're going to be out there. they got something to do. They have a purpose. Do you know that God has given everybody a purpose? And what he's going to do, the first thing he does is put you through some regular, there's some basic things we all got to learn. We got to learn faith. We got to learn how to trust him. Ooh, sometimes it takes a long time. A lot of different runs, a lot of different trials, a lot of different laps to learn how to trust him. Uh, you didn't do so good on that one. Let's just make, let's make another 10 laps. Is it because he's mad at you? No, it's because he's equipping you. He's equipping you for your mission. He's getting you prepared. You don't like it? What? I just ran a quarter mile yesterday. You want me to run a half a mile today? That's me. What? 20 minutes on the tre treadmill? Why do people get on treadmills? You're not going anywhere. Why do you get on a treadmill? It seems really stupid that you're not going anywhere. Well, why do you do it? There's a purpose in it, isn't there? It's building you up. It's conditioning you. It's building you for a purpose. Endure hardship as training. God is training you for reigning. He's training you how to walk around your little zone on your zone and that you can know how to be equipped when somebody at work says that to you or all of a sudden this happens to you or that's going on in the world and they're talking at the at your workplace about why this happened or you're at school they're talking about this and all of a sudden see God is trying to train us how does he do this um I love I'm gonna read you the the this scripture right here in the uh NIV then I'll read King James he, says, he said my son don't make a lot of the Lord's discipline and that word there means training do not lo lose heart if he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines trains the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as a son. Now, in King James, that says, that word right there, it says scourges. Now, King James says, he chastens, which trains, trains and educates. And he scourges, which means corrects or whips. So, it's funny in this whole long verse, it uses scourge one time. Which is the, the kind I was talking about, when you get a whipping because you keep playing in the fire. And sometimes he has to do that to us. Because you just don't learn any other way. Some kids, you can just speak to them. They, they, you just look at them. They go, ah. The truth is, either one of my girls, we really didn't have to spank them hardly at all. I don't know. They, we, we try to think if Gary ever spanked them. He might have spanked them once or twice. We didn't have to. Our kids just, they can just look at them. It's a fear of mama or something. I don't know. Now, my, me, I don't know what my problem was. My daddy grew a special peach tree for me. <laughs> and he had one playing out behind the church. I used to get a lot of whippings in church for talking. Can you all imagine? I can't imagine, can you? Now, that one is there, but the rest of the whole verse, he don't use that word again. 
The whole rest of this whole thing, it actually means training. It's actually the word tutorage. It means education or training to make you disciplined through action. It's training you. So just think about that word training. He says, God is treating you as children. For what children is not trained by their father? I'm, gonna use the, I'm just going to use the word trained or educated. Because if you're not trained, then you're not even true sons and daughters at all. He said, uh, uh, God disciplines us or trains us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. That means designated purpose set apart for his use. You're going to know who you are. He's going to discipline you so you can share in that holiness. No discipline, no training seems pleasant at the time, but very painful. But later on, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Your problems, your trials, the issues that's happened to you, and let me tell you something, it's not the devil. Oh, the devil may be doing it, but God has allowed some training to happen. And he will do things like he did to Job. He lifted the hedge for a purpose because he was going to use, he wanted, uh, Satan said, I want to test him and see if he really loves you. God knew he loved him. But what he wanted to do is for Job to know. He wanted Job, you look at the end, he said, Job said, I had heard about you, but now I have seen you for myself. Let me tell you where God shows up. He walks in fiery furnaces. He walks on stormy seas. Where did they see him? Let me tell you, you want to see God? You'll see him in those hard times. In the good times, we have goodness of God. But you know what? The good things, what I've discovered people, that we really kind of take the credit ourselves. Oh, I have a good job or I have this or that. We start depending on these things. And the, really the truth is, we don't really praise him as much in the good times, do we? We don't really see him so much in the good times. Where you really get to know God is though I walk through the shadow, of the, the valley of the shadow of death. Some of y'all know we prayed over them, we blessed them, but Kelsey and, and, and Joey buried two sons within a year. And now he's burying his dad. Joey, family, we're with you. We know. You know what I'm talking about. These are not light subjects. That's hardship. Why do babies die? Why do daddies die? Why do we face these things? You know, those are the hard questions of life. But I can tell you this, that if you will give it to him, through those trials and through those tears, the Lord will show you himself like never before. And you will start to see him. And you will start to be trained to understand the faith. And I'm going to tell you, if you'll hold on to your faith, I could get to the last page. It talks about the prizes. And I guess I'm going to have to finish this next week. Y'all going to come back here next week? Chapter 3 of this, because I still hadn't turned the page. We got about 10 minutes, but that same word is translated in Ephesians. Fathers, bring your children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. That's the same word. It means, it says, the same as chastisement. It's training. And also in Second Titus, it's the same word. They translate it to instruction. In, in, in Hebrew, they, he tra it was translated to chastisement, then it was nurture, and now it's instruction. If you look in the Greek, same word. He says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction are in, in righteousness. And that word there where he says, it says, ex is your exercise thereby. He's, that word is gymnosa, which is where we get the word gym, to be trained by exercising or by experience. There's nothing like experience. That's why you go out there. You don't just learn about guns. If you go into the military. You get out there on a firing range. They actually put a gun and bullets, and you aim at things because you need the experience. See, you can read about healing and say, I believe God's a healer. But when you're, laying, you're in there puking your guts out and you don't know and the doctors can't tell you what's wrong, oh, then that's the experience. And then when you're on the way running to the, to the bathroom and you say, God is my healer, and it, it evaporates, then you, whoa, God is a healer. And there's sometimes you're going to go through it, and sometimes you're going to go through it longer. Sometimes you're going to shorter. But that is the whole key, and that's what I've got to hear you see, because we're in a training education program. We are his workmanship, and he is building us up. Jude 1.20 says, Ye beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. 
You build yourself up by praying. What did I say in the beginning? The problem is not the presence of Satan. It's the, pres- it's the lack of prayer. You build yourself up by communicating with God, talking to him and listening to him. And it, that doesn't mean just getting in your prayer closet and praying for 30 minutes or an hour. That means that you're driving down the road. Lord, what do you want me to do about this? This is how we, we, we pray constantly. I feel like he's so close to me all the time. I'm going, we're going places. I'm cleaning my house. I'm talking to God. I'm talk, they think I'm talking to myself. Sometimes I am. But sometimes I'm talking to God. Because I'm sitting here and I'm communicating. And he says, and then when you pray in the Holy Ghost, that means the, Spirit, the Holy Ghost inside you prays for you. All of a sudden you're laying on your bed like what happened with uh, Zach uh, a week ago. He's laying there. He got baptized at our house on Monday. Before the week was out, he was laying on his bed. He told us at a prayer meeting, praying, Lord, just talking. All of a sudden he said, oh, he's just talking another language. He didn't know what he's saying. Just that easy. When you pray, Paul said, I thank God I speak in more tongues than you all. He said, because when I pray, it edifies me. And he said, now, if I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk in tongues to you because you don't edify you. In fact, the only way I'm going to speak in tongues in public is if there's an interpreter. If not, it's out of order. Why don't I just stand up and talk in tongues to y'all? You don't benefit you. But he said, me? He said, oh, when I get with me in the Lord, the Holy Ghost prays through me and it edifies me. It builds me up. He said, in my spirit, I speak mysteries. I don't even know how to pray. And all of a sudden, the Spirit prays for me. And what looked like disaster, what looked like I didn't know what to do, all of a sudden, I get up out of my prayer, and I'm just regenerized, energized. That's it. I'm energized. And I don't even know why. Because praying, building up my faith by praying in the Holy Ghost. And if you have not done that, you need to. It's there for you. Why cut yourself short? Don't, don't, Don't leave that out. This is something that is such a great gift. It'll build you up by praying in the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you what, exercising, building up yourself. Acts uh, 24 and 16, Here do, herein do I exercise myself, that I'll have a conscience void of offense toward God and man. If you want to be a person that's not offending people, you need to start exercising in the spirit. Because if you're letting your, ma- your mouth run off and you're hurting people, you're offending people, you need to give us some communication with the Lord and let him do a, 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 some, or an attitude change or some adjusting on, your, on yourself. He said, you don't be offensive to people. He said, I've got to exercise that. Sometimes you've got to exercise shutting up. It takes practice to shut up and listen. Listening is very hard. Speaking is easy for some people and very hard for others. Your gift will just, if you take it to a limit, it's a, it's a fault. You can be a great speaker if you talk all the time. Nobody wants to hear anything you got to say. That's what my daddy used to say. Pam, you can't tell it all in one day. I can't preach it all in, in 45 minutes, apparently. He said, um, oh, 1 Timothy, refuse profane and old wise fables, but exercise thyself rather to godliness. For it's profitable to all things, having promise of life that is now and life that is to come. If you will exercise, not just listen to what your mama said or your granny said or old wise fables, just because the world does it that way doesn't mean it's God's way. And that takes some exercise and it takes practice to stop listening to every piece of garbage and everything on the internet's not true. I don't care what you Googled. You need to Google God. I mean, this world is deceptive, y'all. Oh, there's so many things out there. And when I went through college, I seen things that they would say, oh, this is proven. And if you read a little deeper, it was just one or two tests. And then they take it for the truth and just say, oh, this is truth. And it wasn't truth. It's never even really been proved. You think about even the theory of evolution. There's a reason it says theory. They've never been able to find the missing link. I don't care what they say. You get in science, and many scientists today, many well-known scientists don't even believe in evolution. Oh, but you don't get that to school. But if you look at it, it still has to say the theory because it's still a theory because it's not been proven scientifically. I don't care what they say. But the more you hear it, the more you believe it. Oh, that's just the truth. Oh, they're just born that way. Or that just happened this way. You know what? There's some things are lies. This world is lying. Everything is on CNN. It's not the truth. We can't even believe our own politicians anymore. We can't believe the things that we hear and see even on television. I'm telling you, you are going to have to start exercising yourself and grow up. And it's not fun. And you don't like it. He said it's not pleasant when you're going through it. But there is a reason. There is always a purpose in your pain. If you don't get anything else, you need to write that 
down. There's purpose in pain. God does not let anything happen to his children that he's not going to turn around and work it for your good. He will work it for his good. If you'll realize I'm not alone in this and I can talk to him, I have a direct line. And this is a big fat liar over here. And the only way you're going to know is to get in the word and exercise yourself in what God says. Because he said, then you'll have a promise of a good life now. I want life now. I ain't just worried about pie in the sky. Oh, it's going to be great to be in heaven with my daddy forever. But I'm worried about today. How about today? We're not supposed to be a bunch of mully grub, boring Christians that have a terrible, boring life just waiting for Jesus to come. Enduring to the end. No, I've got purpose. And he's training me for reigning. I'm supposed to be able to speak healing for people when they call me and say, my grandbaby is so sick, she needs prayer right now. I need to be able to, you know what? But we have prayer meeting every Monday night. Do you think that's easy? No, but it's worth it. Everything that's is 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 worthwhile. It's not easy. It wasn't easy when the Lord called me. I was in my thirties, and He called me to go back to college. I didn't understand that. I had five kids at home. I had two of my own and three foster kids, and coming and other kids coming and going. We were foster parents for CPS, and He called me to go back to college. I didn't know what that was for. I ended up ended up going to college for seven years. I got a master's degree before it was over. You know why? Because there was going to be a day that He was going to call me to TYC. Texas Youth Commission, and the only way I could even put my application into uh, to HR is I had to have a master's degree. Why are you going back to school now for? What are you trying to be? I'm just wee be. I don't know. I'm just going to school. I need some. I said I need some to know how to take care of these teenagers. I had. I had all those foster girls, and they had some problems, and I couldn't find any Christian counselors. So I said I'm gonna go be a Christian counselor myself. I, I thought it was for them. I, I had a short sight, but see, I didn't see the big picture. That God was not only going to make a, foster parents, and I was going to work with those kids, and I was going to work with victims, and I needed to know how to counsel these girls that had been molested and hurt and abandoned and all these things that happened to them. But then God was going to take me to another level, and if I was going to love the victim, which is one level, but then he was going to take me, and he's going to put me in a place. It was going to take a master's degree that I could love and train the victimizers. Now I was not just dealing with the house during the day with those who had been molested, but now I was going to TYC and working in all day long with, the, with child molesters. And he, I was working with sex offenders. Oh, well, somebody's going to work with them. <laughs> I hate to tell you this, but God loves murderers, rapists, child molesters. Oh, I would never pick that. I'd rather go work with a bunch of little orphans or little kids that you think deserve it. They deserve to be locked up. Oh, I found out they were orphans. They were hurt. They were also hurting too. You don't know where God's taking you. You just take it one step at a time. And all the training we went through and the nights, I listened to those kids scream and nightmares and, and all the PPT meetings I sat through and all the trials I sat through and all the stuff I went through. Now when you talk to me, you wonder why I've got some wisdom? Because I've been through some things. I can talk to you about some situations. I can talk to you because I have been able to manage 34 years of marriage and we still got a little hair we ain't pulled out of each other. Uh, we're still together. We still got some things. I have got to, and it says here, a word, you've got to be a first partaker. There's some things that you're going to go before people. Somebody's going to love the child molester. And that's not, it has to be you. That's okay. Don't hate me for it. But God has a plan and sometimes it's so far beyond your plan and you have no idea what he's training you for. You have no idea who he's training you or what you're going to. Some people are not. Some people are going to be in the Navy, but some people are going to be Navy SEALs. Some people are going to be special ops. I've told John over and over. John? Did he had to go to work. Oh, here you are. I said, John, God, how many times have I had to tell you? You had to go through, you buried that, your wife. That young wife, we had her laid right up here. When he buried Shanna. And then having to try to handle a child by himself and work and, and handle them between, the, you know, and do all these things. And then be five years single when he thought, you know, five months would probably be, you know, oh, Lord, how can I? You know, when a man loves, leaves their wife, they don't do well alone. Women do much better alone than men do because they're used to, that's just the way God made it. They're used to having a, a help. They're used to having that companion. It's very hard. People that get divorced, people that go through death and lose their wives, I mean, it's very hard. You know, I don't know if y'all know this, but do you know men commit suicide twice as often as women? Very rare people know that statistic. 
Men have a hard time because they're men. Jesus told, they, he said in the garden, it's not good for me to be alone. Now, some people are called to be alone. They can be okay with it. But it's been a struggle for that young man to be alone for five years and be a, a single father. And it's not because he couldn't get a woman. Y'all know that. God has kept him single for a reason and for a purpose. And I keep saying, John, he's training you for something big. There's a special training that happens. People that go through hardship and terrible things. I'm telling you, Kelsey, God's got a lot of something in your life for you. You don't go through what you've gone through for nothing. God will compensate you. God will compensate you. He told me that I will compensate my people for every blow that the enemy ever got in. And there are times the enemy does get in, especially when we really don't know who we are. But I'm going to tell you, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to quit there because that's the second page starts. This is, is this good to y'all? This is so good to me. I'm telling you, I have just enjoyed eating this and, and, and going on this. I'm telling you what, um, it's just so good. I don't even want to, I, I, I just want, we'll just finish it next week. We'll work on this some more. God is training us for reigning. We have been given dominion in this world. We need to start acting like it. We have just laid down and let the enemy and his little old group of little old bitty imps run things. The Bible said in Revelation, when they see and he's unveiled and everybody's going to be looking, the nations, they're going to see Satan and they're going to say, is that the one that deceived the whole world? That little wimp, that one little mad angry vindictive angel let me tell you something we're unveiling him we're like little toto in the garden in oz he ran back there and pulled the, the pulled the curtain off and there was that big oh i'm the great oz you know he was a little short little man back there with the megaphone i'm the great Oz. he was not the great oz he was a liar he was a deceiver satan is a liar and deceiver and I can't wait to teach you more on this.